Chapter 1 of Swiss Family Robinson in Words of One Syllable. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. When one has a good tale to tell, he should try to be brief, and not say more than he can help ere he makes a fair start. So I shall not say a word of what took place on board the ship till we had been six days in the storm. The bark had gone far out of her true course, and no one on board knew where we were. The masts lay in splints on the deck, a leak in the side of the ship let more in than the crew could pump out, and each one felt that ere long he would find a grave in the deep sea, which sent its spray from side to side of what was now but a mere hulk. "'Come, boys,' said I to my four sons, who were with me. "'God can save us if it please him to do so.' But, if this is to be our last hour, let us bow to his will. We shall at least go down side by side. My dear wife could not hide the tears that fell down her cheeks as I thus spoke to my sons, but she was calm and knelt down to pray, while the boys clung round her as if they thought she could help them. Just then we heard a cry of, Land! Land! Felt a shock, and it was clear that we had struck on a rock, for we heard a loud cry from one of the men, We are lost! Launch the boat! Try for your lives! I went at once on deck, and found that all the boats had been let down, and that the last of the crew had just left the ship. I cried out for the men to come back and take us with them, but it was in vain. I then thought that our last chance was gone. Still, as I felt the ship did not sink, I went to the stern, and found, to my joy, that she was held up by a piece of rock on each side, and made fast like a wedge. At the same time I saw some trace of land which lay to the south, and this made me go back with some hope that we still had a faint chance. As soon as I got downstairs I took my wife by the hand, and said, Be of good cheer, we are at least safe for some time and if the wind should veer round, we may yet reach the land that lies but a short way off. I said this to calm the fears of my wife and sons, and it did so far more than I had a right to hope. Let us now make some food, said my wife. We are sure to need it, for this will no doubt be a night to try our strengths. My wife got some food for her boys, which we were glad to see them eat, poor as it was. But we could not share their meal. Three out of the four were put to bed in their berths, and soon went to sleep. But Fritz, who was our first child, would not leave us. He said, like a good son, that he would try to be of some use, and think what could be done. "'If we could but find some cork,' said Fritz to me in a low tone, "'we might make floats. You and I will not need them, for we can swim, but the rest will want such means to keep them up.' "'A good thought,' said I. Let us try to find what things there are in the ship that we can thus make use of. We soon found some casks and ropes, and with these we made a kind of float for each of the three boys, and then my wife made one for her own use. This done, we got some knives, string, and such things as we could make fast to our belts. We did not fail to look for and find a flint and steel, and the box in which the burnt rags were kept, for these were at that time in use as the means to strike a light. Fritz, who was now well nigh worn out, lay down on his bed and slept like the rest. As for me and my poor wife, we kept watch, each in fear lest the next wave should lift the ship off a rock and break it up. I need not tell you how glad we were when we saw the first gleam of light. At dawn the wind did not blow so strong, the sky was clear of clouds, and we saw the sun rise, and with it rose our hopes. I soon had my wife and sons on deck. "'Where are the men?' they said. How can we steer the ship? My dear boys, said I, he who has kept us safe till now will still aid us. Let all hands set to work and leave the rest to God. At these words we all went to work with a will. My wife went to feed the livestock, Fritz set off in search of arms and the means to make use of them, and Ernest made his way to the tool chest. Jack ran to pick up what he could find, but as he got to one of the doors he gave it a push, and two huge dogs sprang out and leaped at him. He thought at first that they would bite him, but he soon found they meant him no harm, and one of them let him get on his back and ride up to me as I came from the hold of the ship. When the boys had done their search, and the spoil was brought on deck, we thought we had found all that we should need. 
As for me, said my wife, I have brought good news, for I find we have still on board a cow, an ass, two goats, six sheep, a ram, a pig, and a sow, and I have found food for them all. All that you bring will be of use, said I, but I fear that Jack's dogs will do us more harm than good. Not at all, said Jack, for they can help us to hunt when we get to land. Well said, Jack, and now let us see what we can do that will aid us to get there. We then took the casks that we had found, and Ernest and I soon cut them in half. With these tubs we made a kind of raft, though it was no slight task. The tubs, in fact, were a fleet of eight small round boats, made so fast to some planks that no one of them could float from the rest. The next thing to be done was to launch the raft. This we at length did, and when the boys saw it slide down the side of the ship and float on the sea, they gave a loud shout, and each one tried who should be the first to get on it. I made it fast to the ship, and there left it. I then told my wife to change her dress for that of one of the crew, which she had found, as her skirts would have got in her way when she had to climb. She did not at first like this, but did so as soon as she saw the truth of what I told her. At last, when all was done, we went to bed, and I slept as sound as if we had been on land. End of chapter 1 Recording by Gregory Eccles, Bloemfontein, South Africa Chapter 2 of Swiss Family Robinson in Words of One Syllable This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gregory Eccles Swiss Family Robinson in Words of One Syllable by Lucy Aiken Chapter 2 we were all up at the break of day, and knelt down to thank God that he had kept us from harm through the night. We then put all the things on the raft, and ten live hens and two cocks were put in one of the tubs. Some ducks and geese we let go, in the hope that they would swim to the shore, and a pair of doves were set free, as they could fly to the land. There was a place in the raft for each of us. In the first tub sat my wife. In the next, Frank, who was eight years old. In the third, Fritz, not quite twice the age of Frank. In the fourth were the fowls and some old sails that would make us a tent. The fifth was full of good things in the way of food. In the sixth stood Jack, a bold lad, ten years old. In the next, Ernst, twelve years of age, well taught but too fond of self and less fond of work than the rest. While I sat in the eighth, to guide the raft that was to save all that was dear to me in the world. As soon as the dogs, Bill and Turk by name, saw us push off from the ship, they leaped into the sea, swam near the raft, and kept well up with us. The sea was calm, so that we felt quite safe. We made good use of the oars, and the raft bore its freight straight to the land, but as we drew near to the shore, the sight of the bare rocks led us to think that we might still be in need of food and drink when that which we had was gone. As we got near, the coast lost its bare look, and we were glad to see that there were no lack of trees. We soon found a bay to which the ducks and geese had found their way, and here we saw a place where we could land. As soon as we had made the raft fast with a strong rope, we took out all our wealth and made a tent with the old sailcloth we had brought with us and stuck a pole in the ground to keep it up. This done, I sent the boys to get some moss and dry grass to make our beds with. With the flint and steel we soon set fire to some dry twigs, and my wife made a pot of soup with what she had brought from the ship. Fritz, who had charge of the guns, chose one and took a stroll by the side of a stream, while Jack went in search of shellfish, which he thought he might find on the rocks. My share of the work was to save two large casks which were near the shore, while I was up to my knees in the sea, I heard a shrill cry, which I knew to come from Jack. I got out at once, took up an axe, and ran to his help. I found him with his legs in a rock pool, where a large crab held him by his toes. It soon made off as I came near, but I struck at it with the axe, and brought it out of the pool. Jack then took it up, though it gave him a pinch or two ere he found out how to hold it, and ran off in high glee to show what he had caught. When I got back to the tent, I found that Ernst had brought us news, that he had seen salt in the chinks of the rocks, and that shellfish were not scarce. 
Well, my boy, if you are sure you saw them, I will ask you to go back for some. We must each do some work for the good of all. He went and soon found the salt left by the sea on the rocks, which the sun had made quite dry. There was some sand with it, but my wife did not take long to find a way to cure that. She had been to a fresh stream with a large jug. From this I saw her pour some on the salt, strain it through a cloth, and let it drip in a cup, so that all the sand was left on the cloth. When the soup was made hot we each had a taste, and all said that it was good. "'Be not in too great haste,' said my wife. "'We must wait for Fritz. But if he were here, I do not see how we are to take our soup, for we have no plates or spoons. "'If we have but some large nuts,' said Ernest, "'we might cut them in half, and they would make good bowls.' "'Quite true,' said I. "'But as there are none, we may as well wish for delf bowls and real spoons at once.' "'Now I have it,' quoth Ernest. "'Let us take the shells I saw on the shore.' Off ran Jack to the shore, with Ernst at his heels, and back they both came with large and small shells for us all. Just then Fritz came in, with a look of gloom on his face, which I could see was a sham. "'You do not mean to tell me you have come back with naught,' said I, as he put out both his hands as if to prove that such thing was the case. But Jack, who had been round him, cried out, "'No, no, he's got a pig!' Such a fine one! Tell us where you found it! Fritz now brought forth his prize. When I saw it, I knew, from what I had read, that it was not a pig, but a swift beast, known in these parts that live on fruit and nuts, and hides in the earth. I like the place much more than I do this spot, said he. The shore lies low, and there are planks, casks, chests, and all sorts of things that the sea has thrown up. Why not leave this place at once and go there? There is a time for all things, said I. We must at least rest here for one night. We all sat down to take our soup with the shell spoons. Ernst took from his coat a large shell, which he had hid till now, put it in the soup, and then set it down to cool. You do not show want of thought, said I to him, but I am not glad to see that you think so of yourself, and do so much for your own ease, when all the rest do so much for yours. Now that shell full of soup you must give to our two dogs. We can all dip our small shells in the pot, and you must do as we do. I knew he felt hurt at this, but he gave it to the dogs at once, and they soon made quick work of their share of the soup. The sun was low when our meal came to an end. The fowls came round to us to pick up the stray crumbs we had let fall, and my wife took out her bag of grain and fed the cocks and hens, and sent them to roost on the top of our tent. We took care to load our firearms, in case we might need them in the night, sang a hymn of praise to God, and then left our fate in his hands. End of chapter 2 Recording by Gregory Eccles, Bloemfontein, South Africa Chapter 3 of Swiss Family Robinson in Words of One Syllable This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sarah Luann. Swiss Family Robinson in Words of One Syllable by Lucy Aiken. Chapter 3. As soon as I heard the cock crow, and saw by the light that it was break of day, I got out of bed and spoke to my wife as to what we should do next. First, said I, Fritz and I will make a tour of the coast, and try to find some of the men who left the ship, for if they are here they may be in want. But, said Fritz, who had heard me from his bed, why should we search for those who left us to die on the wreck? Well, I will tell you, said I. First we should do to them as we would wish them to do to us, not as they have done. Next we know that they took no food with them, and we should not leave them to starve. And last it may be that they can help us, though now they stand more in need of our aid. The boys were soon up when we all sat down to a good meal. That done, Fritz and I got our guns. I put a pair of small arms in his belt, and gave him a game bag and told him to take an axe. I took some food for us both, and a full flask, out of which we could drink if we should stray far from a stream. When we took our leave, my wife and the three boys were in tears. The dog Bill we left to guard the tent, but Turk went with us and ran by our side. We soon got to the banks of a stream but then had to make our way down its course. It took us some time to reach the seashore. There was not a boat to be seen, nor any sign that the ship's crew had found the land. We left the shore and went through a wood full of tall trees. Here Fritz struck some hard thing on the ground with his foot, which we found to be a coconut. 
He gave it a blow with his axe and broke the shell, and we both sat down to rest and eat the nut. At the end of the wood we came to a plain, which gave us a clear view of the place. Fritz, who was on the lookout, ran off with Turk to some strange trees that he saw on the right. When I got up to him it gave me no small joy to find that it was a gourd tree. Try, said I, if you can get hold of one of those queer lumps that grow on it. With that he brought one down, and we had a look at it. Now of this, said I, we can make a plate, a dish, or a flask. Wild men set great store by its shell, which they used to hold their food and drink. We then set to work to make plates of the gourds. When we had made some eight or ten bowls, and some flat ones for plates, we laid them out in the sun to dry, and then went on our way. We could see, not far off, a grove of fine palm trees, but to reach them we would have to pass through reeds and long grass. I knew this was just the place to find snakes, so we each cut a cane, that we might beat them off should we meet with any. As I took hold of my staff, I felt a gum or juice ooze out of the end. I put my tongue to it, and found it of a sweet taste. This led me to suck the reed, and I then knew that we had met with the sugar cane. By this time Fritz had done the same, for I could see that he held his cane to his mouth. "'Do not suck too much of it,' said I, "'or it will make you ill, but let us cut some of the best and take them back with us, for those at home will prize so great a treat.' It did not take us long to reach the place where the palms grew, and then we sat down in the shade to eat the food we had brought with us. "'Do you see those nuts at the top of the trees, Fritz?' said I. "'To be sure I do, but they are far too high to reach. "'Look, look!' he cried. "'There are some monkeys. Let me have a shot at them.' "'Do not do that,' I said, and held his arm. "'It will do us no good to kill them, and I think I can make use of them.' With that I threw some stones up at the tree where they were, though they had got safe out of my reach. They then made a loud noise, took hold of the nuts that were near, and flung them straight at us. The trick made Fritz laugh, who soon had hard work to pick up the nuts that were thrown at him. We broke some of the nuts, and put the juice of the canes in the thick white cream, which forms close to the shell, and this made us a dish that Fritz said was fit for a king. Fritz and I then made fast some nuts to a string, which I tied round my waist, while he took up his canes, and we both set off on our road home. End of chapter 3 Recording by Sarah Luann Chapter 4 of Swiss Family Robinson in Words of One Syllable This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gregory Eccles Swiss Family Robinson in Words of One Syllable by Lucy Aiken Chapter 4 On our way back we took up the gourd bowls and plates, which we found quite dry and hard as bone, and put them in our bags. We had scarce got through the wood when Turk made a dart in front of us, and we saw a troop of apes rush out of the way. But he gave a leap and brought down one that could not climb so fast as the rest, for she had a young one in her arms. Turk made short work of the poor thing, for ere Fritz could call the dog off, the ape was dead. The young one, as soon as it saw Fritz, sprang on his back, put its claws in his curls, and would not let go. I at length got the ape from Fritz's back, and took it up in my arms like a child. We found that it was too young to seek its own food, and as Fritz said he should like to take it home, we put it on Turk's back. Turk did not at first like this, but we soon got him to bear the ape, which held so tight by the hair on the dog's neck that it could not well fall off. Fritz then led Turk with a string, that he might not stray out of sight or throw off his charge, which I think he would have done had we not been on the watch. It did not take us long to reach the bank of the stream near to our home. I need not tell you how glad my wife and sons were to see us safe back, or with what joy the boys took the real live ape out of Fritz's arms. At length, when they got more stayed, I told them that we had brought them all sorts of good things, but that we had not met with any of the men whom we went in search. God's will be done, said my wife. Let us thank him that you have come back safe to us. This day to me has been an age, but put down your loads, for we must now go in and hear what you have to tell. Fritz and I then told them, by turns, where we found the things we brought with us, how we made and dried the plates and bowls, cut the canes, and caught the ape in the wood. Our tales had not come to an end when we were told that it was time to sup. 
Ernst had shot a wild goose, and some fish had been caught in the stream. With these, and the Dutch cheese that we had brought from the ship, we made a good meal. But the boys would not rest till we broke some of the nuts, from which they drank the milk, made sweet with the juice of the canes. I must tell you that we ate our food in great state from our gourd rind plates, which my wife said she should prize more than if they were made of pure gold. That night the ape went to bed with Jack and Fritz, and we all slept in peace till the cocks on the roof of the tent woke us up. Next day Fritz and I went back to the wreck to save the livestock and get what else we had left that might be of use to us. We found it no light task, for we had to make floats for the cow, the ass, the sheep, and the goats, throw them in the sea, and tie them with ropes to our raft. We put on board the raft a vast deal of food that had not been spoiled by the sea, though the waves had made a breach in the side of the wreck. We then put to sea with our train of livestock made fast to the stone. We had not gone far when I heard a loud cry of fear from Fritz. We are lost! We are lost! See what a great shark is on its way to us! Though pale with fright, he took aim with his gun and shot the fish in the head. It sank at once, but left a track of blood in the sea, which I knew to be a sign that we were once more safe. We then got to land, and made fast our freight to the shore. Ere we had done this, our friends came to give us what help they could to get the beasts out of the stream, and take them up to the tent. The poor things were well nigh worn out, but we took good care of them, and put them to rest on some dry grass that my wife had laid out for them. That night we did not sup on the ground. My wife had spread a cloth on top of a cask, and we each sat on a tub. With the knives and forks that we had found in the ship, we ate a dish of hot ham and eggs nor did we fail to test the wine I had brought with me in a small cask from the wreck. Ere bedtime my wife had told me that, while I was at the wreck, she had gone in search of some place in which we could build a house. "'And did you find one, my dear?' I said. "'Oh, yes,' said she. "'We can take you to a great tree that will serve us well, if we can but get across the stream with our goods.' "'But would you have us roost like fowls in a tree? How do you think we could get up to our perch?' Was there not a large lime tree in our town in which they built a ballroom with stairs up the trunk? To be sure there was, said I, and if we cannot build in it, we can at least make use of its shade and dwell in a hut on the roots. Ernst said that he took a string and found that it was twelve yards round. This led me to think that my wife's scheme was by no means a bad one, and that I would have a look at the tree the next day. When I had heard all they had to tell, we knelt down to pray, and then sought a good night's rest, which the toils of the day made us much in need of. End of chapter 4 Recording by Gregory Eccles, Bloemfontein, South Africa Chapter 5 of Swiss Family Robinson in Words of One Syllable This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gregory Eccles Swiss Family Robinson in Words of One Syllable by Lucy Aiken Chapter 5 When I rose from my bed the next day, I said to my wife, Does it not seem, my dear, as if God has led us to this place? and that we should do wrong to leave it. "'What you say may be quite true, so far as it goes,' she said. "'But I must tell you that the midday heat is more than we can bear, and that if we stay here we may have to keep watch at night, for there are, no doubt, wild beasts of some kind that will find us out, and we should not trust too much to our dogs, who may lose their lives in a fight with them.' "'I dare say you are right,' said I. "'But I do not see how we can cross the stream. We shall first have to build a bridge.' The boys were now all out of their beds, and while my wife went to milk the cow and cook some food, I made my plans known to them. They were all glad when they heard that we were to leave, and each said he would help to build the bridge. The first thing to be done was to find some strong planks, and Fritz, Ernst and I went down to the shore, and got in the boat which the tide took down to the bay. On a piece of land which lay to the left we could see some large dark thing, round which flew a flock of seagulls. We put up a sail and caught a gust of wind which had sprung up, and this soon brought the boat to the spot. We made no noise, but crept up the shore step by step, and we got so near that Ernst brought down some of the birds with a stick. 
Fritz was the first to find out that what the seagulls had just left was the huge fish he had shot in the sea. We cut off some rough skin, which we thought might serve for files, and then went back to the boat. I took a glance at the shore ere I got in, and to my great joy I saw some of the planks and spars from the wreck lay on the ground not far off. Our next care was to bind these so as to make a raft, which we tied to the stern of the boat, and then, by the use of us oars, soon made our way up the stream to the place where the bridge was to be built. Our young friends were glad to see us back so soon, and ran to meet us. Jack had a cloth in his hand, in which was a store of crayfish and crabs, just caught in some of the nooks of a rock up the stream. "'Do not fail to give God thanks,' said I, "'that our lot has been cast where we can pick up more food than we can eat.' It would take a long time to tell how we brought all the wood up to the spot, built piers of stone in the stream, and put the planks one by one in the place. It was late at night when we left off work, and once more sought our tent. The next day we saw the sun rise, and took our first meal in haste, for we knew we should have a long day's toil. All the stores that we could not take with us were laid by in the tent, the door of which was made safe by a row of casks that we put around it. My wife and Fritz soon led the way. The cow went next, then the ass, with Frank on its back. Jack led the goats, and on the back of one of them sat the ape. Ernst took charge of the sheep, and I brought up the rear as chief guard. We took care to cross the bridge one at a time, and found it bore our weight well, but once or twice we thought the cow would step in the stream, or fall off the boards, when she went to the sides to drink. Just as we had left the bridge, Jack cried out, Be quick! Here is a strange beast with quills as long as my arm. The dogs ran, and I with them, and found a large porcupine in the grass. It made a loud noise, and shot out its quills at the dogs, and made them bleed. At this Jack shot the beast, which fell dead on the spot. My wife's first thought was to dress the wounds made by the quills, which had stuck in the nose of one of the dogs while the boys made haste to pluck some of the quills from the skin of their strange prize. At last our march came to an end, and I saw for the first time the great trees that my wife had told me of. They were of vast size, and were, I thought, fig trees. If we can but fix our tent up there, I said, we shall have no cause to dread, for no wild beasts can reach us. We sent Frank off to find sticks with which to make a fire, and my wife made some soup of the flesh of the beast we had slain, though we did not like it so well as we did the ham and cheese we brought with us. End of chapter 5 Recording by Gregory Eccles, Bloemfontein, South Africa Chapter 6 of the Swiss Family Robinson in words of one syllable this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April Gonzalez. Swiss Family Robinson, in words of one syllable, by Lucy Eichen. Chapter 6 the meal at an end, my first thought was to make some steps by means of which we could reach the first strong branch of a tree. Ernest and I went in search of some thick canes that grew in the sands hard by. These we cut down, bound to them four long poles, and thus made a pair of steps that would, we thought, reach far up the trunk. On our way back to the sands, one of the dogs made a dart at a clamp of reeds, and a troop of large birds rose in a wing, with a loud noise. Fritz let fly at them, and brought down two at a shot. One of them fell quite dead, but its mate, though hurt in the wing, made use of its long legs so well that it would have got off if Bill had not held it. The joy of Fritz, to have caught such a strange bird, was so great that he would have us at once bind it by the neck and take it back with us. Look, said Ernest, what fine plumes he has, and you see he has wet feet like a goose, and has long legs like a stork. Thus he can run and land as fast as he can swim. Yes, said I, and he can fly with more speed through the air, for these birds have great strength in their wings. In fact, few birds have such means of flight as the flamingo. My wife thought a great bird might need more food than we could spare. I told her that he would feed on small fish and worms, 
and not rob our geese of their grain. I then tied him to a stake near the stream, and in a few days we were glad to find that he knew us, and would come at a call, like a tame bird. While I sat on the grass with my sons, late in the day, I thought we'd try to make a bow and thus save our shot. This I did with a long cane in a piece of string, and then made a dart with a sharp point, which I shot off and found it would go straight. The branch of the tree on which we were to fix our hut was so high that our steps would not near reach it. I tied some strong thread to the dart, and shot it over the branch, then tied a piece of rope to the end of the thread, and drew that up, and at last made a long row of cane steps, with a rope at each side, which we drew up to the first strong branch. The boys were all now in haste to climb the tree, but I chose that Jack, who was light of build and sure of foot, should go up first and try the strength of our work. Fritz went up next with some nails, and made the ropes fast to the tree, while well, I drove stakes in the ground to keep them firm at the foot. It was now time for me to mount, and, and up I went with an axe to lop off the twigs, and smooth the bough that was to form the ground of our new house. I sent the boys down out of my way, and kept hard at work till it was late, but the sky was clear, and the moon lent me her beams of light to see by. When I came down, my wife spread a good meal on the ground, which we ate as best we could, and then made our beds of dry moss, round which we put heaps of twigs. These we set light to, as watch fires to keep off wild bees and snakes. The tolls of the day had made the boys tired, and they were soon in a sound sleep, but my wife and I took in turns to watch through the whole night. We were all out of bed as soon as light was in the sky and set to work to hoist up the planks that were to form the floor of our hut. These we laid down on the branch, with their ends made fast to a cross piece of wood, that we had to fix to the trunk of the tree. Our nails were long, and we drove each one of them home, so that we had no cause to fear the strength of our work. By the time we had done this, the day was far spent, and we were all glad to lay our tools and rest our limbs. That night we let our fires around the tree, tied the dogs to the roots, and went up to sleep out of harm's way for the first time since we left the ship. When the steps were drawn up, we all felt that we were safe now at last, and that we had brought the tolls of the day to a good end. End of chapter 6 Recorded by April Gonzalez in Cavita, Philippines Chapter 7 of Swiss Family Robinson in verse of one syllable. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April Gonzalez. Swiss Family Robinson in verse of one syllable by Lucy Eichen. Chapter 7 We did not wait next day till the sun shone in upon us. I told my wife and sons that, as it was the Lord's day, we would do no work. Our bees and birds had first to be fed. This was done by my wife, who then brought us some hot milk, and made us sit down in the grass and take it. When our meal was done, I got on a log in front of my son, and we all sang a psalm we knew by heart. Then I sought to teach them and spoke them thus. There was once in a time a great king, who had two vast realms, the land of light and truth and the land of night and sloth. Those two dwelt in the first were full of life and joy. The king held his court, and the place of rest where all was bright. This king had a land not far off, where those for whom he had so much love should dwell ere. They went one by one to the place of rest. This land was the home of earth. He gave to his son the right to rule the host that dwelt in the home of earth, and set forward to think what they were to do and all the ills that would come to them if they did not do, as they were bid. At first they were all glad to hear the way in which they were to live, and at times in which they could reach the line of light and truth. Sad to tell, they soon broke the king's laws, and paid no heed to what they knew to be his will. Still there were a few who did as they had been thought, and dwelt in peace, in the hope that they would please the king, and at last reach the place where he held his court. From time to time ships came into the home of earth, and at last a great ship was sent, the name of which was the grave, which bore the flag of death. To the good it was a sign of hope, but the bad were thrown by the side of it into a state of gloom. 
These ships were not seen until they were close to the shore, and then the crew were sent forth to find those whom they were told to seize. Some went back with them full of joy, but most were seen to weep and mourn their fate. So soon as they were brought in sight of the great king, the prince took those who had done well, and put a white robe on them. But those who went on their own way, when on their home of earth, he sent down to tall and deep, dark minds till time shall be no more. When my sons had heard my tale to the end, they all knew what it meant. I then drew from them the views of what they ought to do to please and serve the great king. We then sang a hymn, and my wife drew from a bag the Bible, which I gave to one of the boys, who read from it in a clear, loud voice. When this was brought to a close, we all knelt down in the grass to pray, and to ask God to bless the means we took to learn his will. We did no work that day, but took a long stroll up the banks of the stream. The next day Ernest and Jack tried to scale with a bow, and brought down some small birds that came to the great tree in quest of figs. I gave them the leap to kill what they could, for I knew if put in cast made air tight with grease, they would keep for a time, and might prove a boon if our stock of food should get low. When we sat down to dine, the thought struck me that it would be well to give some name to each part of the land that was known to us. This was at first a source of some fun, for Fritz said we should call the bay we had found the shell spoons by the name of Spoon Bay. But Jack, who still had a mark in his toe where the crab gave him a pinch, thought we ought to term it Crab Bay. If you'll let me give it a name, said my wife, I should wish to know it by some term that will make us bear in mind how good God was to lead our raft there, and I don't think Safe Bay will be a bad name for it. So let it be, said I and from that time Safe Bay had a name. We shall be the name of the spot where we spent our first night on shore. We shall give that its name, said I to Fritz. Let us call it Tent House. That will do, said I. And now for the spot at the mouth of the Safe Bay, where we found our planks. Sharp point, said Ernest. Place from which Fritz and I saw for a trace of our shipmates was to be known as No Man's Cape. Then we had a boy's bridge, which name I gave it from a wish to please my sons, which had done so much to build it. But what shall we call the place which is most dear to us all? No, my dear, said I to my wife, it is your turn. What shall we say? Let us call it the nest, said she, and with that I gave each of my young birds a glass of sweet wine. Here's to the nest, said I. And may we live long to bless the day and the means that brought us here. When the heat of the day was past, I told my sons that I should be glad to take a walk with them. My wife said that she should like to go with us, so we left the nurse in charge of the Turk, and bent our course through the banks of the stream. In our way we went past some shrubs and rare herbs, which my wife knew well how to make use of should we fall sick, and Ernest found a large pot of gran, on which grew a fine coat of potato. At these the boys set to work with such zeal that we soon had a bag full of ripe fruits. We then went into the tent house, which we found in the same state as when we left it to cross the stream on our way to the great tree. We found that our ducks and geese had grown so well and that they would not come near us. So, while my wife and I went to pick up such things as we thought we might take back with us, Ernest and Fritz were sent to catch them and to tie the legs and wings, and in this way we got them at last to the nest. End of chapter 7 Recording by April Gonzalez in Cavita, Philippines Chapter 8 of Swiss Family Robinson in Words of One Syllable This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bill Mosley. Swiss Family Robinson in Words of One Syllable by Lucy Aiken. Chapter 8. It took the whole of the next day to make a sledge, to which we tied the ass and drove to Tent House. On our sledge we put such of the casks which held food and took them back to the nest. Fritz and I went once more to the wreck 
and this time we brought off chests of clothes, pigs of lead, cartwheels, sacks of maize, oats, peas, and wheat. With a strong bar we broke down some of the doors, and took such parts of the ship as we thought would aid us to build our house, which as yet was far less safe than I could wish. These we bound with cords and made them float back at the stern of the raft. When we got to the shore, my wife and the three boys were there to greet us. My first care was to send for the sledge, and with this we took most of our new wealth up to the nest. The next day I told my sons that they must now learn to run, to leap, to climb, and to throw stones straight at a mark, as all these things would be of great use to them in their new mode of life. I next taught them to use the lasso, by means of which men catch the wild horse on the vast plains of the new world. I tied two stones to the ends of a cord some yards in length, and flung off one of them at the trunk of a young tree. The cord went round and round it in a coil, and bound it so tight that I could have drawn it to me had it not been fast in the ground. This trick the boys were not slow to learn, and Fritz, in a short time, could take an aim as well with a stone as he could with his gun. As yet we had not seen much of the isle, for it took most of our time to build the house. But one day we made up our minds that we would all start on a tour. We rose at dawn, put the ass in the sledge, took what food we thought we should need, and set out from the nest just as the sun rose. When we came to the wood where Fritz found the ape, he told them by what means we got the nuts. But now there were no apes there to throw them down. Oh, if one would but fall from the trees, he said. The words had but just left his lips when a large nut fell at his feet. He made a start back, and two more came down near the same spot. As the nuts were far from ripe, I was at a loss to know how they could fall off the tree, for I could not see an ape nor a bird near. I went close up to the tree and saw a large land crab on its way down the trunk. Jack struck a blow at him with a stick, but did not hit the beast. He then took off his coat and threw it on the crab's head, while I made an end of him with an axe. I told them that these crabs climb the trees and break off the nuts, as we had seen, and then come down to feast on them at their ease. But how do they crack the nuts? said Jack. They make a hole through the shell at the thin end, and then suck them dry. The dead crab was put in the sledge, and we went on through the wood. When we came to the gourd wood, we sat down to make some more bowls and flasks to take back with us. Ernest had gone to try what new thing he could find, but he had not been from us long, when we heard him cry out, A wild boar! A great wild boar! Come here, pray! We took up our guns and went at once with the dogs to the spot. We soon heard Turk give a loud bark, and just then we heard Ernest laugh and saw the two dogs come through a clump of brushwood with our old sow fast by the ears. She did not seem to like the way in which they had put an end to her feast of fruit, so she ran back as soon as we told the dogs to let go their hold of her ears. But with all our sport, said Fritz, we have a poor show of game. Let us leave the young ones and set off to see what we can meet with. Ernest sat down with Frank, and we left them and my wife at the gourd tree, while Fritz and Jack set off with me to a high rock which we saw on the right. Fritz, look here, said Jack, as he made his way to the rock. What have you found now? said Fritz. I don't know what it is, but it's a fine prize. When I went up, I saw at once that it was a large iguana, the flesh and eggs of which are both good for food. I had heard that these and such like beasts will stand still if you play an air on a pipe. So I crept near and made a low sound with my lips, while I held in my right hand a stout stick, to which I had tied a cord with a noose, 
and in my left hand a slight wand. I saw it first move its tail and then draw its head from side to side, as if to look where the sound came from. I then threw the noose round its neck, drew it tight, got on its back with a leap, and thrust the wand up its nose, which is the sole part of the beast where there are no hard scales. It bled at once, and was soon dead, nor did it seem to feel any pain. Our prize, which was near five feet long, was no slight weight to lift. I got it at last on my back, and thus we went back to the gourd tree, where we found the rest quite safe. It took us a long time to reach the nest that night. My wife did her best to dress some of the flesh of the land crab, but it was tough and did not taste so nice as the soup made from the beast that we had caught by the nose. End of chapter 8 Recording by Bill Mosley, Bernardo, Texas, USA Chapter 9 of Swiss Family Robinson in Words of One Syllable This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gregory Eccles Swiss Family Robinson in Words of One Syllable by Lucy Aiken Chapter 9 Fritz and I spent the whole of the next day in the woods. We took the ass and one of the dogs with us, but left all else at home. Our way first lay through a dense wood, where we saw no end of small birds, but such game could not now tempt Fritz to waste his shot. We then had to cross a vast plain, and to wade through the high grass, which we did with care, lest we should tread on some strange thing that might turn and bite us. We came at last to a grove of small trees, and in their midst I saw a bush, which I knew to be the wax tree, for the wax grew on it like white beads. I need not say how glad I was to find so great a prize. We had up to this time gone to bed as soon as the sun went down, for we had no lamp to use, but as we could now make wax lights, I told Fritz that we had found what would add two or three hours per day to our lives. We took as much of the wax as would serve us for some time, and then made our way out of the grove. How came you, said Fritz, to know so much of the queer beasts trees and plants that we have found here. When young, said I, I used to read all the books that fell in my way, and those that told of strange lands and what was to be seen in them had for me as great a charm as they have for Ernst, who has read a great deal and knows more of plants than you do. Well, said he, I will do the same if I but get the chance. Can you tell what is the name of that huge tree on the right? See, there are balls on the bark." We went close to it, and found that these balls were of thick gum, which the sun had made quite hard. Fritz tried to pull one of them off, but felt that it clung tight to the bark, though he could change its shape with his warm hands. Look, said he, I feel sure that this is the India rubber which we used to clean our school books. I took a piece of it in my hand, and said, To be sure it is. What shall we not find in this rich land? I then told him how the men in the New World made flasks of this gum, in which form it is sent to all parts of the world. And I do not see why we should not make boots of it in the same way. We have but to fill a sock with sand, then put gum all round it, while in a soft state, till it is as thick as we need, then pour the sand out, and we shall have made a shoe or a boot that will at least keep out the damp, and that is more than mine do just now. Not far from this we came to a bush, the leaves of which were strewn with a white dust, and close by were two or three more in the same state. I cut a slit in the trunk of one of these, and found it full of the white dust, which I knew by the taste to be sago. We took all of this that we could get out of the tree, for it would add to our stocks of food, and when our bags were full we laid them on the back of the ass, and set off to find our way back to the nest. Each day brings us fresh wealth, said my wife, but I think we might now try to add to our goods. I knew that she had some fear lest we should one day get lost in the woods, or meet with wild beasts, so I at once said that we would now stay home, for at least for some days. My first work was to make some wax lights, for my wife could then mend our clothes at night, while we sat down to talk. 
This done, the next task they gave me was to make a churn. I took a large gird, made a small hole in the side, and cut out as much as I could, so as to leave but the rind. In this I put the cream, laid a piece on the hole, and bound it up so that none could come out. The boys then held a cloth, and on it I put the gird, which they rolled from side to side. They kept up this game with great mirth for near an hour, when my wife took off the string, and found that the churn had done its work well. As our sledge was not fit to use on rough roads, my next work was to make a cart. I had bought a pair of wheels from the wreck, so that my task did not prove a hard one. While I was thus at work, my wife and the boys took some of the fruit trees we had brought with us, and put them in the ground where they thought they would grow best. On each side of the path that led from the nest to the boys' bridge, they put a row of young nut trees. To make the path hard, we laid down sand from the seashore, and then beat it down with our spades. We were for six weeks at this, and such like work. We were loth to spare any pains to make the nest, and all that could be seen near it, look neat and trim, though there were no eyes but our own to view the scene. One day I told my sons that I would try to make a flight of stairs in place of the cane steps with rope sides, which were, to tell the truth, the worst part of our house. As yet we had not used them much, but the rain would some day force us to keep in the nest, and then we should like to go up and down stairs with more ease than we could now climb the rude steps. I knew that a swarm of bees had built their nests in the trunk of our tree, and this led me to think that there might be a void space in it some way up. Should this prove to be the case, I said, our work will be half done, for we shall then have but to fix the stairs in the tree round the trunk. The boys got up and went to the top of the root to tap the trunk, and to judge by the sound how far up the hole went, but they had to pay for their want of thought. The whole swarm of bees came out as soon as they heard the noise, stung their cheeks, stuck to their hair and clothes, and soon put them to flight. We found that Jack, who was at all times rash, had stuck the bees' nest with his axe, and was much more hurt by them than the rest. Ernst, who went to his work in his slow way, got up to it last, and thus did not get more than a sting or two, but the rest were some hours ere they could see out of their eyes. I took a large gird, which had long been meant to serve for a hive, and put it on a stand. We then made a straw roof to keep it from the sun and wind, and as by this time it grew dark, we left the hive there for the night. Next day the boys, whose wounds were now quite well, went with me to help to move the bees to the new home we had made for them. Our first work was to stop with clay all the holes in the tree but one through which the bees were wont to go in their nest. To this I put the bowl of a pipe, and blew in the smoke of the weed as fast as I could. At first we heard a loud buzz, like the noise of a storm afar off. But the more I blew my pipe, the less there grew the sound, till at last the bees were quite still. We now cut out a piece of the trunk, three feet square, and this gave us a full view of the nest. Our joy was great to find such a stock of wax, for I could see the comb reached far up the tree. I took some of the comb in which the bees lay in swarms, and put it by on the plank. We then put the gird on the comb that held the swarm, and took care that the queen bee was not left out. By these means we soon got a hive of fine bees, and the trunk of the tree was left free for our use. We had now to try the length of the hole. This we did with a long pole, and found it reached as far up as the branch on which our house stood. We now cut a square hole in that side of the trunk next the seashore, and made one of the doors that we had brought from the ship to fit in the space. We then made the sides smooth all the way up, and with planks and the staves of some old casks, built up the stairs round a pole which we made fast in the ground. To do this we had to make a notch in the pole, and one in the side of the trunk for each stair, and thus go up step by step till we came to the top. Each day we spent a part of our time at what we could now call the farm, where the beasts and fowls were kept, and did odd jobs as well, so that we should not make too great a toil of the flight of stairs, which took us some six weeks to put up. One day Fritz caught a fine eagle, which he tied by the leg to a branch of the tree, and fed with small birds. It took him a long while to tame, but in time he taught it to perch on his wrist, and to feed from his hand. He once let it go, and thought he would have lost it, but the bird knew it had a good friend, for it came back to the tree at night. 
From that time it was left free, though we thought that some days its love of war and wild sports would tempt it to leave us for the rocks of the seashore, where Fritz had first found it. Each of my boys now had some pet to take care of, and, I may say, to tease, for they all thought they had a fair right to get some fun out of the pets they could call their own, but they were kind to them, fed them well, and kept them clean. In what I may term my spare time, which was when I left off work out of doors, I made a pair of gum shoes for each of my sons, in the way I had told Fritz it could be done. I do not know what we should have done had we not found the gum tree, for the stones soon wore out the boots we had, and we could not have gone through the woods or trod the hard rocks with bare feet. By this time our sow had brought forth ten young pigs, and the hens had each a brood of fine chicks. Some we kept near us, but most of them went to the wood, where my wife said she could find them when she had need to use them. I knew the time must now be near when, in this clime, the rain comes down day by day for weeks, and that it would wash us out of the nest if we did not make a good roof to our house. Then our livestock would need some place where they could rest out of the rain. The thatch for the nest was of course our first care. Then we made a long roof of canes for our livestock, and on this we spread clay and moss, and then a thick coat of tar, so that it was rainproof from end to end. This was held up by thick canes stuck deep in the ground, with planks made fast to them to form the walls, and round the hole we put a row of cask staves to serve for rails. In this way we soon had a barn, storeroom, and hayloft, with stalls for the cow, the ass, and what else we kept that we had need of space to live in. End of chapter 9 Recording by Gregory Eccles, Bloemfontein, South Africa Chapter 10 of Swiss Family Robinson in Words of One Syllable This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gregory Eccles Swiss Family Robinson in Words of One Syllable by Lucy Aiken Chapter 10 Frank one day found some long leaves, to which, from their shape, he gave the name of sword leaves. These he brought home to play with, and then, when he grew tired of them, threw them down. As they lay on the floor, Fritz took some of them in his hand, and found them so limp that he said he could plate them, and make a whip for Frank to drive the sheep and goats with. As he split them up to do this, I could not but note their strength. This led me to try them, and I found that we had now a kind of flax plant, which was a source of great joy to my wife. "'You have not yet found a thing,' she said, "'that will be of more use to us than this. Go at once, and search for some more of these leaves, and bring me the most you can of them. With these I can make you hose, shirts, clothes, thread, rope. In short, give me flax, and make me a loom and some frames, and I shall be at no loss for work when the rain comes.' I could not help a smile at my wife's joy when she heard the name of flax, for there was still much to do ere the leaves could take the shape of cloth, but two of the boys set off at once to try to find some more of the flax. While they were gone, my wife, full of new life, and with some show of pride, told me how I should make the loom by means of which she was to clothe us from head to foot. In a short time they came back, and brought with them a good load of the plant, which they laid at her feet. She now said she would lay by all else till she had tried what she could make of it. The first thing to be done was to steep the flax. To do this we took the plant down to the marsh, tied up in small bales, as they pack hemp for sale. The leaves were then spread out in the pond, and kept down with stones, and left there in that state till it was time to take them out, and set them in the sun to dry, when they would be so soft that we could peel them with ease. It was two weeks ere the flax was fit for us to take out of the marsh. We spread it out on the grass in the sun, where it dried so quick that we took it home to the nest the same day. It was then put by till we could find time to make the wheels, reels, and combs which my wife said she would want to turn our new-found plant to its best use. We now made haste to lay up a store of canes, nuts, wood, and such things as we thought we might want, and took care, while it was still fine, to sow wheat, and all the grain we had left in our bags was soon put in the ground. The fear that the rain might come up and put a stop to our work led us to take our meals in haste, and to make the days as long as we could. We knew the rain was close at hand, for the nights were cold, large clouds could be seen in the sky, 
and the wind blew as we had not felt it since the night our ship had struck on the rock. The great change came at last. One night we were woke up out of our sleep with the noise made by the rush of the wind through the woods, and we could hear the loud roar of the sea far off. Then the dense storm clouds which we had seen in the sky burst on us, and the rain came down in floods. The streams, pools, and ponds on all sides were soon full, and the whole plain round us met our view as one vast lake. By good luck the sight of our house stood up out of the flood, and our group of trees had the look of a small isle in the midst of the lake. We soon found that the nest was not built so well as we thought, for the rain came in at the sides, and we had good cause to fear that the wind would blow the roof off. Once the storm made such a rush at it that we heard the beams creak, and the planks gave signs that there was more strain on them than they could bear. This drove us from our room to the stairs in the trunk, on which we sat in a state of fear till the worst of the storm was past. Then we went down to the shed we had built on the ground at the root of the tree, and made the best shift we could. All our stores were kept here, so that the space was too small to hold us, and the smell from the beasts made it far from a fit place for six of us to dwell in, but it was at least safe for a time, and this was of course the first thing to be thought of. To dress our food we had to make a fire in the barn, and as there was no place to let the smoke out, it got down our throats and made us cough all the day long. It was now for the first time that my wife gave a sigh for her old Swiss home. But we all knew that it was of no use to grieve, and each set to work to do all he could to make the place look neat and clean. Some of our stores we took up the stairs out of our way, and this gave us more room. As we had cut square holes in the trunk of the tree all the way up and put in frames of glass that we got from the ship, my wife could sit on the stairs with Frank at her feet and mend our clothes. Each day I drove from the barn such beasts as could bear to be out in the rain. That we might not lose them, I tied bells round their necks, and if we found that they did not come back when the sun came down, Fritz and I went out to bring them in. We oft got wet through to the skin, which gave us a chill, and might have laid us up if my wife had not made cloth capes and hoods for us to wear. To make these rainproof, I spread some of the gum on them while hot, and this, when dry, had the look of oilcloth, and kept the head, arms, chest, and back free from damp. Our gum boots came far up our legs, so that we could go out in the rain and come back quite free from cold and damp. We made but few fires, for the air was not cold, save for an hour or two late at night and we did not cook more than we could help, but ate the dried meat, fowls, and fish we had by us. The care of our beasts took us a great part of the day. Then we made our cakes and set them to bake in a tin plate on a slow fire. I had cut a hole in the wall to give us light, and put a plane of glass in it to keep out the wind, but the thick clouds hid the sun from the earth, and the shade of the tree threw a gloom round our barn, so that our daylight was but short, and night came in far too soon. We then made use of our wax lights, and all sat round a bench. My wife had as much as she could well do to mend the rents we made in our clothes. I kept a log, in which I put down, day by day, what we did and what we had seen, and then Ernst wrote this out in a neat, clear hand, and made a book of it. Fritz and Jack drew the plants, trees, and beasts which they had found, and these were stuck in our book. Each night we took it in turns to read the Word of God and then all knelt down to pray ere we went to bed. Ours was not a life of ease, it is true, but it was one of peace and hope, and we felt that God had been so kind to us that it would be a great sin to wish for what it did not please Him to grant us. My wife did all she could to cheer us, and it was no strange thing for us to find that, while we were out in the rain with the livestock, she had made some new dish, which we would scent as soon as we put our heads in at the door. One night it was a thrush pie, the next a roast fowl or some wild duck soup, and once in a while she would give us a grand feast, and bring out some of all the good things we had in store. In the course of our stay indoors we made up our minds that we would not spend the next time of storm and rain, when it should come round, in the same place. The nest would serve us well in that time of year when it was fine and dry, but we should have to look out for some spot where we could build a house that would keep us from the rain the next time the storms came. Fritz thought that we might find a cave, or cut one out of the rocks by the seashore. I told him that this would be a good plan, but would take a long while to do. By this time the boys were all well used to hard work, and they thought they would much like to try their skill at some new kind of work. Well, said I, we will go to the rocks around Tent House in the first fine day that comes, and try to find some place that will serve to keep us from the next year's storms. 
End of chapter 10. Recording by Gregory Eccles, Bloemfontein, South Africa. Chapter 11 of Swiss Family Robinson in Words of One Syllable. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gregory Eccles. Swiss Family Robinson in Words of One Syllable by Lucy Aiken. Chapter 11. I cannot tell how glad we all were when we at last saw a change in the sky and felt once more the warm rays of the sun. In a few days the flood sank in the earth and left the ground of a bright green hue. The air grew warm and dry and there were no more dark clouds to be seen in the sky. We found that our young trees had put forth new leaves and the seed we had sown had come up through the moist ground. The air had a fresh, sweet smell, for it bore the scent of the bloom which hung like snowflakes on the boughs of the fruit trees. The songs and cries of birds were to be heard on all sides, and we could see them fly from tree to tree in search of twigs to build their nests. This, in fact, was the spring of the year when all things put forth new life, and we knew that the time now come when we could once more range the woods and till the soil, and this made the boys leap for joy. Some planks had been blown off the roof of the nest, and the rain had got in here and there, so our first job was to mend our house and make it fit to sleep in. This done, Jack, Fritz, and I set out to Tent House. We found it in a sad state. The storm had thrown down the tent, blown off some of the sailcloth, and let in the rain on our casks, some of which held a store of food. Our boat was still safe, but the raft of tubs had broken lip, and what there was left of it lay in splints on the shore. Our loss in the storm had been so great that I felt we ought at once to seek for some place on the rocks where we could put what was left. We went all around the cliffs, in the hope that we might find a cave, but in vain. There is no way but to hew one out of the rock, said Fritz. We must not be beat. Well said, Fritz, said Jack. We have each an axe. Why not try this cliff at once? I gave them leave to try, and we soon set to work at the rock. From this spot we had a good view of the whole bay and could see both banks of the stream. With a piece of chalk I made a mark on the side of the cliff to show the width and height that the cave should be cut. Then each took an axe to try what kind of stuff our rock was made of. We found it a hard kind of stone, and as we were not used to this sort of work, we had not done much when the time came for us to leave off. We came back next day and got on with more speed, though we thought it would take us less than six months to make the cave, if our work were done at the same rate each day. At the end of five or six days we had got through the face of the rock, and we found the stone soft. In a day or two more we came to what was but hard clay, which gave way at a slight blow from the axe. We need not fear now, said I, for we shall soon have a hole as large as we want. With the earth we took out, we made a ridge in front of the cliff. The boys now got on so well and dug so much out that I had hard work to throw up the earth on the bank. One day, as Jack stuck his pick in at the back of the cave, which was now more than eight feet from the front, a great mass of the rock fell in and he cried out, Look here, I've got through. Through what? said I. Not through your hand, I hope. No, no, but through the rock. At this Fritz set up a loud laugh. Why not say through the world at once and push our crowbar in till you reach Europe? which, Ernst says, lies in a straight line from our feet. I should like to have a peep down such a hole, for I might thus get a sight of our dear Swiss home. Fritz and I went up to the wall and found that Jack was right, for he had come to a clear space. His first thought was to jump in, but as I knew that there might be foul air in the cave, I would not let him risk his life. The boys then set fire to some dry grass and thrust it in the hole, but it went out at once, which was a sure sign that the air was not fit to breathe. I knew that we had brought from the wreck a box full of fireworks, which were used on board to make signs to ships far out at sea. I sent Fritz to Tent House for these, though I thought that they might be too damp to make use of. When he came back, I set light to some of them and threw them in the hole. They flew round and threw out a stream of sparks that lit up the cave. When these were burnt out, we put in a heap of straw and threw a light on it. This was now soon in a blaze, and gave us a clear view of the cave, but it was too deep for us to see the end. 
our joy was so great that we sent jack off home to the nest to tell the good news and to bring back some wax lights i did not deem it safe for us to go in the dark in the cave for there might be pools or deep dry pits in the ground fritz and i had just thrown up on the bank the last spade full of earth that had been dug out when we heard a loud shout we got up on the top of the cave and saw that jack had brought a tribe at his heels the large cart drawn by the cow and the ass came on at a slow pace led by jack on a black ox and in it were my wife frank and ernst by the help of a flint and steel i soon lit some of the wax lights and gave one to each i went in first and led the way and the rest kept close at my back we had not gone on more than a few steps when we came to a dead stop struck with awe at the grand sight that met our view the walls and roof of the cave were lit up as it were with star-like gems while some hung down like glass drops from the roof and some rose up from the ground at its sides like blocks of spar i broke off a piece and put it to my tongue what does it taste like said jack i find said i that we are in a cave of rock salt we shall not have to scrape the rocks to get our salt now said ernst for there is more here than would serve a whole town for a lifetime when we went back to the nest that night we laid out a plan for our new home for there could be no doubt that the cave was the best place for us to dwell in, though we should still sleep in the nest when we went that side of the stream. The next day we all set to work. The floor of the cave was quite smooth and the walls dry, so that we could build at once. We first cut holes in the sides of the rock to let in the light, and then brought flames and panes of glass from the nest, and put them in. We then brought all the planks and wood we could find, and built a strong wall in the midst of the cave. On the right side of this wall we made three rooms, two of which were to be used as bedrooms, and one to take our meals in. On the left side was a room for my wife to cook in, one to work in, to which we gave the name of the shop, and a place with stalls in it for our livestock. At the back of these was a storehouse, where we could keep our stock of food and the whole of our spare goods. I need not say that it took us some months to do all this, nor that we had to toil hard day by day, from morn till night, ere we got to the end of our task, but the end did come at last, and then the joy we felt that we had done all this with our own hands more than paid us for our toil. End of chapter 11 Recording by Gregory Eccles, Bloemfontein, South Africa Chapter 12 of Swiss Family Robinson in Words of One Syllable This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marty on the Central Coast of California. Swiss Family Robinson in Words of One Syllable by Lucy Aiken. Chapter 12 Our fields near Tent House had by this time brought forth good crops of wheat, maize, beans, and peas. But as the work of the cave had for some weeks kept us on this side of the stream, we did not know in what state we should find our crops at the nest. One day we all set out for our old home. We found our cornfields of a rich brown hue, and saw that the wheat was, for the most part, fit to reap. This and a large patch of rye we cut down, and as we did so, whole flocks of birds took to wing when we got near them while quails were seen to run off at the sight of our dogs, who had no lack of sport that day. We laid by the seed that was quite ripe till the time should come for us to sow it, and put the rest in sacks. Some of the wheat was laid up in sheaves till we should have time to beat out the grain. When we left the nest for the cave, we could not find the hand mill that we had brought from the ship. This now came to light, and we took care to pack it up to take with us as we should want it to grind our corn. That night we slept once more in the great tree, but I must say that we did not now sleep so sound there as we used to do, nor did we feel so safe as we did in our rooms at Rock House. The next day we were to start a plan by means of which our livestock would not want so much of our care. They had bred so fast that we could well spare some of them, and these, I thought, might be left in some place to seek their own food, and yet be in reach should we want them. My wife took from her hen roost ten young fowls, and I took four young pigs, four sheep, and two goats. These we put in our large cart, with such tools as we thought we should need, tied the black ox, the cow, and the ass to the shafts, 
and then set off from the nest. We had to cross a wide plain, and here we met some dwarf plants on which, as Jack would have it, grew snowballs. Fritz ran to see what they were and brought me a twig to which clung balls of snow-white down. I held it up to show my wife, for I knew that the sight would please her still more than her sons. See, said I, this is the cotton plant, which we have oft tried to find. It seems to grow here as thick as weeds, and if I'm a judge, it is of the best kind. We got as much of this as our bags would hold, and my wife took care to pluck some of the ripe seed that we might raise a crop in our grounds at the tent house. At the end of the plain we came to the brow of a high hill, from which the eye fell on a view the like of which we had not yet seen. Trees of all kinds grew on the sides of the hill, and a clear stream ran through the plain at its base, and shone bright in the rays of the sun. We said at once that this should be the site of our new farm. Close by we found a group of trees, the trunks of which, as they stood, would do for the main props of the house. I had long had a mind to build a boat, and here I at last came on a tree that would suit. Fritz and I went for a mile or two in search of what we could find, and by the time we came back my wife had put up our tent for the night. We then all sat down to sup and went to rest on beds made of the bags of the white down that we brought from the trees on the plain. The next day we rose at dawn. The trees which were to form the frame of our farmhouse stood on a piece of land eight yards long by five wide. I made a deep cut in each of the trunks, ten feet from the ground, and put up cross beams to form a roof on which we laid some bark in such a way that the rain would run off. We were hard at work for some days at the farmhouse. The walls we built of thin laths and long reeds, wove close for six feet from the ground, but the rest we made of thin cross bars to let in both light and air. We made racks to store bay and such like food for the livestock, and put by some grain for the fowls, for our plan was to come from time to time to feed them till they got used to the place. Our work took us more time than we thought and as our store of food got low, we sent Fritz and Jack home to bring us a fresh stock and to feed the beast we left at the tent house. While they were gone, Ernest and I made a tour of the woods for some miles round the new farm. We took the course of the stream that ran by the foot of the hill. Some way up we came to a marsh on the edge of a small lake, and here in the swamp grew a kind of wild rice, now ripe on the stalk, round which flew flocks of birds. We shot five or six of these, and I was glad to note the skill in which Ernest now used his gun. I took some of the rice that my wife might judge how far it was of use to us as food. We went quite round the lake and saw plants and trees that were not known to me, and birds that Ernest said he had not seen in any of the woods near the nest. But we were most struck with the sight of a pair of black swans and a troop of young ones that came in their train. Ernest would have shot at them, but I told him not to kill what we did not want for use. We did not get back till late in the day. Jack and Fritz, whom we met just as we came round the foot of the hill, had done their task well, for they had a good stock of food in a sack that lay on the back of the ass, and they brought the good news that all was well at home. We spent four more days at the farm, and then left it in such a state as to be fit for our use when we chose to go back to it. The farmhouse was but a part of our plan, for we had made up our minds to build a sort of halfway house, or cot, in which we could rest on our way to the farm. This took us six days to do. The spot we chose lay by the side of a brook, and was just such a place as would tempt one to stop and rest in the shade of the trees that grew on the bank. While at the brook, I made a boat out of a tree we found at the farm, and took it back with us to Tent House in the cart. We had still two months ere the rain would set in, and this left us time to put the last touch to our cave. We laid the whole floor with clay, and spread on it some fine sand which we beat down till it was quite smooth and firm. On this we put sailcloth, and threw down goat's hair and wool made moist with gum. This was well beat and, when dry, 
made a kind of felt mat that was warm and soft to tread on, and would keep the damp from our feet. By the time these works were done, our cave was in a fit state for us to dwell in. We did not now dread the rain, for we were safe out of its reach, and there was no need that we should go out in it. We had a warm light shop to work in by day, a snug place where we could take our meals and dry bedrooms in which we could sleep in peace. Our livestock we kept in a shed at the back of the cave, and our storeroom held all we could want. When the rain at length set in, we all had some task that kept us close at work in the cave. My wife took her wheel, or her loom, both of which I had made for her, for this kind of work fell to her share from choice. By the help of the wheels of one of the ship's guns, I had made a lathe, and with this I could turn legs for stools and chairs. Ernest, too, was fond of the lathe, and soon learned to do such work quite as well as I. At dusk, when we had done our work for the day, we brought out our stock of books and sat down to read by the light of the lamp. At times, Jack and Frank would play a tune on their flutes, which I had made out of reeds, and my wife, who had a sweet voice, would sing some of the old Swiss songs that brought to our minds the joys of home. Though we were by no means dull, nor in want of work to fill up our time, we were glad when the time came for the rain to cease, and when we could gaze once more on the green fields. We went out the first fine day and took a long walk by the base of the cliff. On the shore we found a dead whale, which the sea had no doubt thrown up in the storm. We had long felt the need of oil, for though we had a lamp, we had naught but our wax lights to put in it, and these gave a poor light to read by. The next day we cut up the whale and put the flesh in tubs. It was far from a clean job, for the oil ran down our clothes and made them smell. But as we could change them for new ones, thanks to the hemp and my wife's skill, we did not mind that, for the oil was now worth more to us than our clothes, though at one time we should not have thought so. One day we all set out to tour to the farm. Jack and Frank had gone on first, while my wife and I were as yet close to the cave. All at once the boys came back, and Fritz said, Look at that strange thing on its way up the path. What can it be? I cast my eye on the spot and cried out, Fly, all of you to the cave, fly for your lives! For I saw it was a huge snake, or boa, that would make a meal of one of us if we did not get out of its way. We all ran indoors and put bars up to the door of the cave. A large dovecote had been made on the roof, and to this we got up through a hole in the rock. Ernest took aim with his gun and shot at the snake. So did Fritz and Jack but it gave no sign that they had hit it. I then tried my skill, but it did not seem to fill my shot any more than theirs, though I was sure I must have struck its head. Just as we took aim at it once more, we saw it turn round and glide through the reeds in the marsh. Our fears kept us up for three long days in the cave. The snake gave no sign that could lead us to think it was still near, but the ducks and geese had left the spot where their nests were and this we knew to be a bad sign. On the fourth day I went to the door with a view to let out some of the beasts to graze, for we were short of food for them. The ass was just at my back, and as soon as it saw the light, made a rush to get out. Off it went, straight to the sands, with its heels in the air, but just as it got to the marsh we saw the boa glide out from the reeds, part its wide jaws, and make for its prey. The ass at once saw its foe, but stood still if struck with fear, and in less time than I take to tell it, our old friend was tight in the folds of the boa. This was a sad sight for all of us, yet we could not take our eyes off the snake, but saw it crush the poor beast, and then gorge its prey. When it had put the whole of the ass out of sight, it lay down on the sand quite still as if it had gone to sleep or died. Now is the time to seal the fate of our foe, said I to Fritz, and with that we went out with our guns. When we got near, we both took a straight aim, and each put a ball in its head. This made it move with a start, 
and writhe as if in pain. See how its eyes glare on us with rage? Now load your gun, and let us put a bit more lead in him. Our next shot went in his eyes. It then shook with a strong spasm and fell dead on the sand. A shout of joy brought my wife and the three boys to the spot. The state of fear that they had been kept in for the whole three days had made them quite ill. But now the joy of Jack and Frank knew no bounds, for they leaped on the snake and beat it as if they would go mad. My wife said that the death of the boa took a great weight off her mind, for she thought it would lie in wait for us near the cave, starve us out, and then kill us as it had done the poor ass. We slid up the snake and took out the flesh of the ass, which the boys laid in a grave near Tent House. The boa skin we hung at the door of the cave, over which Ernest wrote the words, No ass to be found here, which we all thought to be a good joke. One day, late in the spring, I went with my three sons a long way from the cave. My wife and Frank were left at our halfway house to wait till we came back, but the dogs went with us. Our route lay far up the course of a small stream, which had its source some miles north of the farmhouse. The ground was new to us, but we could not well lose our way, for on the right stood a hill from which we could see the whole of the plain. Ernest had gone with one of the dogs to a cave that he had spied at the foot of the hill, but we saw him turn round and run back with Turk at his heels. As soon as he thought his voice would reach us, he cried out, A bear! A bear! Come to my help! We could now see that there were two great beasts at the mouth of the cave. At a word from us, both the dogs flew to fight the bear that stood in front. Fritz took up his post at my side, while Jack and Ernest kept in the rear. Our first shot was a miss, as Jack said, but we took a sure aim the next time, and both shots told. We would have let fly at them once more from this spot, but as we thought we might hit our brave dogs, who were now in the heat of a hard fight with their foes, we ran up close to them. Now, Fritz, said I, take a straight aim at the head of the first, while I fire on the one at his back. We both shot at once, the bears gave a loud growl, and then with a moan, fell dead at our feet. As it was now time to go back, we put the bears in the cave, but took care to cut off their paws, which form a dish fit to grace the feast of a king. We had a long walk back to the place where I had left my wife. The boys told her what a hard fight the dogs had with the bears, and how Fritz and I had shot them, and then gave her the paws. With the aid of Frank, she had fed our livestock and brought in wood to make up our watch fire for the night. So we sat down to sup at once and then went to rest. Next day, we put our beasts to the cart and drove as far as the bear's den. As we came near to the spot, a flock of birds flew out of the mouth of the cave, two or three of which Fritz brought down with his gun. It took us a whole day to cut up the bears. The hams were laid by to be smoke-dried, while my wife took charge of the fat and the skins. End of chapter 12 Read by Marty on the central coast of California Chapter 13 of Swiss Family Robinson and Words of One Syllable this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marty on the Central Coast of California. Swiss Family Robinson in Words of One Syllable by Lucy Aiken. Chapter 13. We had now so much work to do, and the days and the weeks came and went so quick that I do not think. We should have known the time of year had it not been for our log. Some days were spent at the cave, where we made our goods, ground our flour, stored our food, and kept our tame livestock. Then we had to take care of our crops in the fields near the nest, and this took us two or three days in each month. 
Once in ten days, at least, we went to the farm on the hill and at the same time made a call at the halfway house, so that there was not a day that we had not had our hands quite full. Now and then when we went out to hunt for sport, or to add to our stock of beasts, which had grown so large that there were few we could name that had not been caught and brought home. We had birds of the air, fowls of the land, and beasts of all kinds, from the great black ox of the plain to the small wild rabbit that came and made its hole close by our cave. But there was one bird that we had not yet caught. Though we had seen it two or three times in the woods, this was the ostrich. Fritz found a nest with some eggs in it, and this led us to make a tour with a view to catch one of the old birds. We rose that day ere it was light and set out at dawn, each on the back of a good steed. As we should have to hunt through the woods, my wife was left at home, and Ernest, who did not like rough work, chose to stay with her. We made it a rule to take one of the dogs with us when we went out to hunt, but on this day we thought it was wise to let them both come. Fritz took us straight to where he had seen the nest, which was not more than a few miles up the stream. When we came in sight of the spot, we saw four great birds, as if on their way to meet us. As they drew near, we kept the dogs well in and made no noise, so that they did not stop till they came near us. Fritz had brought his eagle with him, which he now let fly, and at one swoop the bird came down on the head of the ostrich, held on with its beak, and struck out its wings with great force as if to stun it. We now rode up close to the scene of war. Jack first flung a cord round the legs of the bird, which made it fall to the ground. I then threw my pouch on its head, and, strange to say, it lay down still as a lamb. I now tied both its legs with cords, but left it just room to walk. We then made it fast to the two bulls that had brought Jack and Frank all the way from home, and put one of them on each side. They next got up on their steeds, and I took the pouch from the head of the bird. As soon as it could see, it gave a wild stare, and then fought to get free. The boys then put spurs to the flanks of their steeds, and when the bird had made a few starts back as if to try to strengthen the cords which held it, it set off with a run, and the bulls at each side made it keep up a smart pace. Fritz and I now went in search of the nest, which we soon found. I took the eggs from it and put them in a bag I had brought to hold them, in which I put some wool and moss so that they should not break. It did not take us long to get up to the two boys who had gone on first and we were glad to find that the poor bird had made up its mind to fate, and kept up well with the pace of the bulls. When we got in sight of home, my wife and Ernest, who had been on the lookout for us, came forth to meet us, and the strange way in which we brought home our new prize made them laugh. I need not say that we took great care of it. The next day we built it a house, with a space in front for it to walk up and down, round which were put rails, so that it could not get out. At first it was shy and would not take any food so that we had to force some balls of maize down its throat. But in a short time it took grain from the hands of my wife, and soon grew quite tame. The boys now set to work to break it in for use. They taught it first to bear them on its back. Then they put a pair of string reins in its mouth, and made it turn which way they chose to pull, and to walk, or run, or stand still, as it was bid. Thus, in a month from the time we caught it, the boys made it take them on its back to and from the farm or the nest, in less than half the time an ox would go, so that it came to be the best steed we had to ride on. The eggs we found in the nest were put in a warm, dry place, and though we scarce thought our care would bring live birds out of the shells, we had the joy to hatch three of them, and this led us to hope that we should ere long have a steed for each of our sons. My work at this time was by no means light. Our hats and caps were all worn out, and with skins of the musk cat I had to make new ones. The bear's skins were laid in the sun to dry, and of these we made fur coats which would keep us warm when the cold wet nights came round, and there were some left to serve as quilts or rugs for our beds. I now tried my hand at a new craft. I dug some clay out of the bed of the stream, and taught the boys to knead it up with sand, 
and some talc that had been ground as fine as road drift. I had made a lathe with a wheel, and by its aid the clay left my hands in the shape of plates, cups, pots, and pans. We then burnt them in a rude kiln, and though at least one half broke with the heat and our want of skill, still those that came out whole more than paid for my toil, and kept up my wife's stock of delf. Some of the jars were set round with red and blue beads, and these were put on the shelf as works of art, and kept full of long dried grass. The time was now at hand when we must reap our grain and store the ripe crops that were still on the ground, and, in fact, there was so much to be done that we scarce knew what to do first. The truth must be told that our wants did not keep pace with the growth of our wealth, for the land was rich, and we had but a few mouths to fill. We knew that we might leave the roots in the ground for some time, as the soil was dry, but that the grain would soon spoil so we made the corn our first care. When it was all cut and brought home, our next task was to thresh it. The floor of our storeroom was now as hard as a rock, for the sun had dried it, and there was not a crack to be seen. On this we laid the ears of ripe corn, from which the long straw had been cut, and sent the boys to bring in such of our livestock as were fit for the work to be next done. Jack and Fritz were soon on the backs of their steeds, and thought it fine fun to make them course round the floor and tread out the grain. Ernest and I had each a long fork, with which we threw the corn at their feet, so that all of it might be trod on. The ox, on which Jack sat, put down his head and took a bunch of the ears in his mouth. Come, said Jack, it's not put there for you to eat, off you go. And with that he gave it a lash with his whip. Nay, said I. Do you not know what God has said in his word? We must not bind up the mouth of the ox that treads out the corn. This brings to my mind the fact that the means we now take to thresh our wheat were those used by the Jews in the days of old. To sort the chaff from the grain, we threw it up with our spades while the land or sea breeze blew strong. The draft, which came in at the door, took the light chaff with it to one side of the room while the grain fell straight to the ground by its own weight. The maize we left to dry in the sun, and then beat out the grain with long skin thongs. By this means we got a store of the soft leaves on this plant, which my wife made use of to stuff our beds. When all the grain had been put in our storeroom, some in sacks and the rest in dry casks, we took a walk one day to our fields, and found that the flocks of birds most of which were quails, had come there to feed. This gave us a fine day sport with our guns, and the next year we did not fail to look for them, so that the fields were made to yield a stock of game as well as a crop of grain. With but slight change in our mode of life, we spent ten long years in our strange home. Yet the time did not seem long to us. Each day brought with it quite as much work as we could do, so that the weeks and months and years flew past, till at last we gave up all hope that we should leave the isle or see our old Swiss home, the thought of which was still dear to us. But the lapse of ten years had wrought a great change in our sons. Frank, who was but a mere child when we first came, had grown up to be a strong youth, and Jack was as brave a lad as one could wish to see. Fritz, of course, was now a young man. He took a great share of the work off my hands. Ernest had just come of age, and his shrewd mode of thought and great tact was as great a help to us as was the strength and skill of the rest. To crown it all, it was a rare thing for them to be ill, and they were free from those sins which too oft tempt young men to stray from the right path. My wife and I did our best to train them so that they might know right from wrong. And it gave us great joy to find that what we told them sunk deep in their hearts, and like ripe seed sown in rich soil, brought forth good fruit. I need not say that in the course of ten years we had made great strides in those arts which our wants had first led us to learn. When we first came, the land near Tent House was a bare waste, 
Now it bore fine crops and was kept as neat as a Swiss farm. At the foot of the hill by the side of Rock Cave was a large plot of ground which we laid out in beds, and here we grew herbs and shrubs and such plants as we used for food. Near this we dug a pond, and by means of a sluice which led from the stream we kept our plants fresh in times of drought. Nor was this the sole use we made of the pond, for in it we kept small fish and crabs, and took them out with a rod and line when we had need of food and time to spare for that kind of sport. In the ground round the mouth of the cave we drove a row of strong canes, bound at the top by a piece of wood so as to form a fence, up which grew a vine, and at each side plants that through a good show of gay bloom crept up to meet it. Shells of great size and strange shapes were got from the shore, and these were built up here and there with burnt clay, so as to form clumps of rockwork, on which grew ferns and rare plants. All this gave a charm to our home, and made the grounds round it a source of joy when we laid by our work for the day. In fact, we thought there was now scarce a thing to wish for that we had not got. Our cares were few, and our life was full of joy and peace as we could well wish, yet I oft cast a look on the sea, in the hope that some day I should spy a sail, and once more greet a friend from the wide world from which we had been so long shut out. This hope, vague as it was, led me to store up such things as would bring a price. If we had the chance to sell them, they might prove a source of wealth to us if a ship came that way, or would at least help to pay the charge of a cruise back to the land we came from. It is but just to say that the boys did not share my hopes, nor did they seem to wish that we should leave the place where they had been brought up. It was their world, and the cave, to which we gave the name Rock House, was more dear to them than any spot on earth. Go back, Fritz would say, to leave our cave that we dug with our own hands, to part with our dear kind beasts and birds, to bid good-bye to our farms, and so much that is our own, and which no one in the world wants. No, no, you cannot wish us to leave such a spot. My dear wife and I both felt that age would soon creep on us, and we could not help some doubts as to the fate of our sons. Should we stay and end our days here, some of us would outlive the rest and this thought came off to my mind and brought with it a sense of dread I could not get rid of. It made me pray to God that he would save us all from so dire a fate as to die far from the sound of the voice of man, with no one to hear our last words, or lay us in the earth when he should call us to our rest. My wife did not share this dread. Why should we go back? she would say. We have here all that we can wish for. The boys lead a life of health, free from sin, and live with us, which might not be the case if we went out in the world. Let us leave our fate in the hands of God. End of chapter 13 Read by Marty on the Central Coast of California Chapter 14 of Twist Family Robinson in Words of One Syllable This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Donna Winters of Swiss Family Robinson in Words of One Syllable by Lucy Eichen. As Fritz and Ernest were now men, they were of course free to go where they chose, and to come back when their wit led them home. Thus, from time to time they took long trips, and went far from Rock House. They have fine boats and strong steeds, and of these they made such good use that there was a scarce a spot for leaks round that was not well known to them. At one time, Fritz had been so long from home that we had a dread lest he should have lost his way or fallen a prey to wild beasts. When he came back he told us a long tale of what he had seen and where he had been, and how he had brought with him bird, beast, mouth, and such strange things as he thought Ernest would like to see. When he had done, he drew me out into our grounds, and said he had a strange thing to tell me. It seems that he found a piece of white cloth tied to the foot of a bird, which he had struck down with a stick, on which were these words, Save a poor soul who is in the rock from which you may see the smoke rise. He thought that this rock could not be far off, 
and that he ought to set off at once in search of it. I have a thought, said he. I will tie a piece of cloth, like that I found, to the leg of the bird, and on it I will write, Have faith in God, help is near. If the bird goes back to the place from whence it came, our brief note may reach the eye of the long one in the rock. At any rate, it can do no harm, and may do some good. He at once took the bird, which was an albatross, tied the strip of cloth to its foot, and let it go. And now, said he, tell me what you think of this, if we should find a new friend, what a source of joy it will be. Will you join me in the search? To be sure I will, said I, and so shall the rest, but we will not yet tell them of this. They were all glad to take a trip in the large boat, but they could not make out why we went in such haste. The fact is, said Jack, Fritz has found some queer thing on the coast that he can't bring home, and wants us to see it. But I dare say we shall know what it all means in good time. Fritz was our guy, and went first in his bark boat, or canoe. In this he could go round the rocks and shoals that girt the coast, which would not have been safe for the large boat. He went up all the small creeks we met on, on the way, and kept a sharp lookout for the smoke by which he would know the rock we came out to find. I must tell you that once when we came to these parts with Ernest, he met with a tiger, and would have lost his life had it not been for his pet eagle. The brave bird, to save Fritz from the beast, made a soup down on its head. Fritz thus caught off with a scratch or two, but the poor bird was struck dead by the blow from the paw of its foe. This was a sad loss to Fritz, for his pet had been a kind friend, and would go with him at all times when he went far from home. There was a scarce a spot we came to that did not bring to the mind of one of us such tale as this, so that we were full of talk while the boat bore us on. We had been out some days, but could find no trace of what we went in search. I rose from my berth at dawn and went on deck with Fritz. I told him that, as we had no clue to the place, we must now give up the search. He did not seem to like this, but no more was said. That day we spent on shore and came back to our boat to sleep at night. Next day we were to change our course and trace our way back for the wind that blew from the sea. When I went on deck next day I found a short note from Fritz, in which he told me that he could not give up the search, but had gone some way up the coast in his small boat. Let me beg of you, he wrote, to lay in, wait for me here, till I come back. When he had been gone two days, I felt that I ought to tell my wife the cause of our trip, as it might ease her mind, and she now has some fear lest her son should not be safe. She heard me to the end, and then said that she was sure he would not fail, but soon bring back good news. As we were all on the lookout for Fritz, we saw his boat a long way off. There is no one with him in the boat, said I to my wife, that does not say much for our hopes. Oh, where have you been, said the boys, all at once as he came on board. But they scarce got a word from him. He then drew me on one side and said with a smile of joy, What do you think is the news I bring? Let me hear it, said I. Then I have found what I went forth to seek and our search has not been in vain. And who is it that you have found? Not a man, he said, but a girl. The dress she wears is that of a man, and she does not wish at first that her sex should be known to more that we can help, for she would not like to meet Ernest and the rest in that state if they knew that she was a girl. And, strange to tell, said Fritz, she has been on shore three days. While I went to tell the news to my wife, Fritz had gone down to his purse to change his clothes, and I must say that he took more care to look neat in his dress than was his wont at home. He was not long, and when he came on deck he bid me say no word to the rest of whom he had found. He leaped like a frog into his light craft and led the way. We were soon on our course through the rocks and shoals, and an hour's sail, with the aid of a good breeze, brought us to a small tract of land, the trees of which hid the soil from our view. Here we got close in to the shore and made our bark safe. We all got out and ran up the banks, led by the marks that Fritz had made in the soil with his feet. 
we soon found a path that led to a clump of trees and there saw a hut with the fire in the front from which rose a stream of smoke as we drew near i could see that the boys did not know what to make of it for they gave me a stare as if to ask what they were to see next they did not know how to give vent to their joy when they saw fritz come out of the hut with a strange youth whose light made fair face and grace of form did not seem too much well with the clothes that hung upon his limbs it was so long since we had seen a strange face that we were all lost to speak first when i could gain my speech i took our friend by the hand and told her in words as kind as i could call to my aid how glad we were to have thus found her fritz when he bade ernest and jack shake hands with her spoke of our new friend as james but she could not hide her sex from my wife for her first act was to fall on her breast and weep the boys were not slow to see through the trick and made fritz tell them that james was not the name they should call her by i could not but note that our strange mode of life had made my sons rough and that years of rude toil had worn off that grace and ease which is one of the charms of well-bred youth i saw that this made the girl shy of them and that the guard she wore brought a blush to her cheek i bade my wife take charge of her and lead her down to the boat while the boys and i stood a while to speak of our fair guest when we got on board we sat down to hear fritz tell how he came to find miss jane for that was her real name but he had not told half his tale when he saw my wife and her new friend come up on deck she still had a shy look but as soon as she saw fritz she held out her hand to him with a smile and this made us feel more at our ease the next day we were to go back to our home and on the way fritz was to tell us what he knew of miss jane for his tale having cut short when she came on deck with my wife the boys did all they could to make her feel at home with them and by the end of the day they were the best of friends the next day we set sail at sunrise for we have far to go and the boys had a strange wish to hear fritz tell his tale when the boat had made a fair start we all sat down on the deck with jane in our midst while fritz told his tale to the end jane rose was born in india she was the child of one captain rose whose wife died when jane was but a baby in arms when ten years of age she sent her to a first-class school where she was taught all that was fit for the child of a rich man to know in course of time she could ride a horse with some skill and she then grew fond of most of the field sports of the east as the captain had to go from place to place with his troops he thought that this kind of sport would train her for the mode of life she would lead when she came to live with him but this was not to be for one day he told jane that he must leave the east and take home the troops as it was a rule that no girl should sail in a ship with troops on board he left her to the care of a friend who was to live near at the same time he saw fit that she should dress in the garb of a young man while at sea as there would then be no need for her to keep in her berth, and he knew that she was strong and brave and would like to go on deck and see the crew at their work he gave the captain pain to part with his child but there was no help for it the ship had been some weeks at sea when one day a storm broke over it and the wind drove it for days out of its course the crew did their best to steer clear of the rocks but she struck on a reef and sprang a leak the boats then put off from the wreck but the wave broke over the one in which jane left and she was borne half dead with fright to the place where we found her she had been thrown high up on the beach and though faint and sick got out of the reach of the wave she did not know if those who were in the boat with her had lost their lives but she has seen no trace of them since when she had strength to walk she found some birds eggs and shellfish which he ate and then went in search of some safe place where she could rest for the night by good chance she had a flint and a knife with these she set light to some dry twigs and made a fire which she did not once let out till the day she left her life was at first hard to bear but she was full of hope that some day if she would come near the shore to which she could make signs for help the wild sports of the east in which she took part had made her strong of limb and she had been taught to make light of such things as would vex most of her sex she built a hut to sleep in and made snares to catch birds 
Some of them she made use of for food, and some she let go with bits of cloth tied to their legs, on which she wrote words, in the hope that they might meet the eye of someone who could help her. This, as we knew, had left Fritz to make his search, the end of which had brought as much joy to us as to the young friend who now sat in our midst. When Fritz had told us this, and much more, we came in sight of Safe Bay. He then took Ernest with him in his small boat, and left us to go up the stream as fast as he could to Rock House, so as to make the place look neat by the time we brought our heads. The two boys, for to us they were still boys, met us on the beach. Fritz, with a look of pride, gave his hand to Jane, and I could see a slight blush right to her cheek as she gave him hers. He then led her up the path, on each side of which grew a row of young trees, and took her to a seat in our grounds. There, he and Ernst had spread out a feast of our best food, fish, fowls, and fruit, and some of my wife's choice jam. While Salburn Clay Plate made a great show on the board, for it was set out with some taste, we had a wish to show Jane that though the coast was a wild kind of place, still there were means to make life a joy to those who dwelt on it, if they chose to use them. As for Jane, the sight of our home, the style of our feast, and the kind of words of the boys, were things so new to her, that she knew not what to say. I shall tell no more than the truth, she said, when I say that what you have shown me is of far more worth than all the wealth I have seen in the East, and that I feel more joy this day than I have felt in all the days of my life. I can use no term less strong than this to show how much I thank you. This was just the kind of speech to please the boys for there had been no one to praise their work till now. When the meal was done, my wife brought us some of her best wine, and we drank to the health of our guests in great state and with loud cheers. We then made our tour of our house and grounds, that Jane might see the whole of the place that from this time she was to make her home. It would take me a long time to tell what she thought of all she saw, or the neat things she said in praise of our skill as we took her from place to place. My wife's room, in which were kept the pots and pans to dress our food, and the plates, bowls, and cups out of which we ate, took her some time to view, for she had long felt the want of such things, as she now saw we had made for our own use out of we could find. The next day we were all went to the nest, and when the rainy season came round, Jane knew the place quite as well as we did. My wife found in her a true friend, for she soon took a large share of the work off her hands, and did it with so much skill, and with so strong a wish to please us, that we grew to love her as if she had been our own child. When the time came for us to keep indoors from the rain, the boys would off lay their work and sit to hear Jane talk of what she had seen in the east and Ernst and Fritz would read to her by turn such books as she might choose. I was glad to see that this wrought a great change in my sons, whose mode of life had made them rough in their ways and loud in the speech, faults which we did not think of so long as there was no one to see or hear them. When the spring came, the boys went in their boat to the spot where they had found Jane, which we now knew by the name of Jane Isle, and brought back some beans, which were new to them. These we found to be coffee. Jane told us that they were by no means scarce, but that she had not made use of them, as she knew no way to roast or green the beans, which she found in a green state. Do you think, said my wife, that the plant will grow here? I then thought for the first time how fond she was of it. There had been some bags on board the ship, but I had not brought them from the wreck, and my wife had once said that she would like to see the plant in our ground. Now that we knew where to get it, she told me that it was one of the few things that she felt the loss of. When the boys heard this, they set out on a trip to Jane Isle, and while there they went to the spot where she had dwelt for so long and sought for what things she had left when she came to live with us. All these were brought to Rock House, and I might tell you that Fritz set great store by them. There were all sorts of odd clothes, 
which he had made of the skin of the seagull, fish line, wrought out of the hair of her head, pins made from the bones of fish, a lamb made out of shell with a wick of the thread which she had drawn from her hose. There were the shells she used to cook her food in, a hat made from the breast of a large bird, the tail of which she had spread out so as to shake her neck from the sun, belts, shoes, and odd things of a like kind. My wife, who had now a friend of her own sex to talk with, did not feel dull when the boys left us for a time. So they had leave to roam where they wished let them, and to stay as long as they chose. In the course of time, they knew the whole of the isle on which we dwelt. Ernst drew a map of it to scale, so that we could trace their course from place to place with ease. When they went for a long trip, they took some dubs with them, and these birds bought us knots tied to their wings from time to time, so that we knew where they were and could point out a spot on the map. I will not dwell on what took place now for some time, for I find that each year was very much like the last. We had our fields to sow, our crops to reap, our beasts to feed and train, and these cares kept our hands at work and our minds free from the least thought of our long mode of life. I turn to my log as I write this, and on each page my eye falls on something that brings back to my mind the glad time we spent at Rock House. End of chapter 14 Recordings by Donna Winters Chapter 15 of Swiss Family Robinson in Words of One Syllable this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gregory Eccles Swiss Family Robinson in Words of One Syllable by Lucy Aiken Chapter 15 In the springtime of the year, when the rain was past, Fritz and Jack set off on a trip in their boat to Shark Isle. The day was fine, the sky clear, and there was no wind, yet the waves rose and fell as in a storm. See, cried Jack, here comes a shoal of whales, they will eat us up. There's no fear of that, said Fritz, whales will do us no harm, if we do not touch them. This proved to be the case. Though any one of them might have broken up the boat with a stroke of its tail, they did not touch it, but swam by in a line, two by two, like a file of troops. On Shark Isle, near the shore, we had thrown up a mound, and built a fort, on which were set two of the ship's guns. There the boys made a rule to fire off, with a view to let us know that they were safe, and to try if the guns were still fit for use. This time they found their charge quite dry, and the guns went off with a loud bang. They had just put a plug in the hole of one of the guns, to keep out the wet, when they heard a sound roll through the air. "'Did you hear that?' said Jack. I'm sure that noise must have come from some ship at sea. Let us fire once more. But Fritz thought they ought to go home at once and tell what they had heard. They both ran to the boat with all speed and put their strength to reach home ere the sun went down. The day was fine, and as the rain had kept us indoors for two months, we were glad to go down on the beach for a change. All at once I saw the boys come up the stream in their boat, at a great speed, and the way they used their skulls led me to think that all was not right. "'What have you seen that should thus put two brave youths to flight?' said I. They then told me what had brought them back so soon. I had heard the sound of the two guns which they had fired off, but no more. I told them I thought their ears must be at fault, and that the sounds they had heard were no more than those of their own guns, which the heels had sent back through the air. This view of the case did not at all please them, as by this time they well knew what sounds their guns made. It will be a strange thing, said I, if the hope to which I have so long clung should at last come to be a fact. But we must have a care that we do not hail a ship, the crew of which may rob and kill us for the sake of our wealth. I feel that we have as much cause to dread a foe as we have grounds of hope that we may meet with friends. Our first course was to make the cave quite safe, and then to mount guards where we could see a ship if one should come near the coast. That night the rain came down in a flood, and a storm broke over us, and we were thus kept indoors for two days and two nights. On the third day I set out with Jack to Shark Isle, with a view to seek for the strange ship which he said he knew must be in some place not far from the coast. I went to the top of a high rock, 
but though my eye swept the sea for miles round, I could see no sign of a sail. I then made Jack fire three more shots, to try if they would give the same sound as the two boys had heard. You may judge how I felt when I heard one, two, three boom through the air. There was now no room for doubt that, though I could not see it, there must be a ship near Shark's Isle. Jack heard me say this with great glee, and cried out, "'What can we now do to find it?' We had brought a flag with us, and I told Jack to haul this up twice to the top of the staff, by means of which sign those who saw it would know that we had good news to tell them. I then left Jack on the fort with the guns, and told him to fire as soon as the ship hove in sight. I bent my way at once back to Rock House, to talk with my wife, Jane, and the boys, as to what step we should now take. They all met me on the beach, and made me tell them the news while I was still in the boat. "'We know no more,' said I, "'than the fact that there is still a ship on the coast. You must all now keep indoors, while Fritz and I go in search of it.' We set off at noon, and went straight to the west part of the coast, where we thought the sound must have come from. We knew a cape there from which we could get a good view of the sea, and by the side of which lay a small bay. When we got round the cape, great was our joy to find a fine ship in the bay. It was not far off from us, for we could see the English flag float in the breeze from one of its masts. I seek in vain to find words by means of which I can set forth in print what I then felt. Both Fritz and I fell on our knees and gave thanks to God that he had thus led the ship to our coast. If I had not held him back, Fritz would have gone into the sea with a leap and swum off to the ship. Stay, said I, till we are quite sure what they are. There are bad men on the seas who put up false flags to lure ships out of their course, and then rob and kill the crew. We could now see all that took place on board. Two tents had been set up on the shore, in front of which was a fire, and we could see that men went to and fro with planks. There were two men left on guard on the deck of the ship, and to these we made signs. When they saw us they spoke to someone who stood near, and whom we thought had charge of the ship. He then put his glass up to his eye and took a good view of us through it. We did not at first like to go too near, but kept our boat some way off. Fritz said he could see that the faces of the men were not so dark as our own. If that be the case, said I, we are safe, and we may trust their flag. We both sang a Swiss song, and then I cried out at the top of my voice these words, Ship ahoy, good men! But they made no sign that they heard us. Our song, our boat, and more than all, our dress, made them no doubt guess that we were wild men of the wood, for at last one of the crew on board held up knives and glass beads, which I knew the wild tribes of the New World were fond of. This made us laugh, but we would not as yet draw nigh to the ship, as we thought we ought to meet our new friends in our best trim. We then gave a shout and a wave of the hand, and shot off round the cape as fast as our boat would take us. We soon got back to Rock House, where our dear ones were on the lookout for us. My wife said we'd done quite right to come back, but Jane thought we should have found out who they were. That night none of us slept well. Our guest thought there might now be a chance for her to reach her home, and she dreamed she heard the well-known voice of her sire call her to come to him. The boys were half crazed with vague hopes, and lay for hours ere they went to sleep. My wife and I sat up late to think and talk of the use that might be made of this chance. We felt that we were now full of years, and should not like in our old age to leave the place where we had spent the best part of our lives. Still we might do some trade with the land from which the ship came, if it were but known that we were here, and we might hear news of our dear Swiss home. At break of day we put on board our boat a stock of fruit and fresh foods of all kinds, such as we thought the crew of the ship would like to have, and Fritz and I set sail for the bay. We took with us all the arms we could find, so as not to be at a loss should the crew prove false to their flag, and turn out to be a set of thieves. As we drew near the ship I fired a gun, and told Fritz to hoist a flag like theirs to the top of our mast, and as we did so the crew gave a loud cheer. I then went on board, and the mate of the ship led me to his chief, who soon put me at ease by a frank shake of the hand. I then told him who we were, and how we came to dwell on the isle. I learned from him, in turn, that he was bound for New South Wales that he knew Captain Rose, who had lost his child, and that he had made a search for her on the coast. He told me that a storm had thrown him off his course, and that the wind drove him on this coast, where he took care to fill his casks from a fresh stream that ran by the side of a hill, and to take in a stock of wood. It was then, he said, that we first heard your guns, and when on the third day the same sound came to our ears, we knew that there must be someone on the coast, and this led us to put up our tents and wait till the crew should search the land round the bay. I then made the crew a gift of what we had brought in our boat, and said to Captain Stone, for that was his name, 
I hope, sir, that you will now go with me to Rock House, the place where we live, and where you will see Miss Rose, who will be glad to hear some news of home. To be sure I will, and thank you much, said he, and I have no doubt that Mr. West would like to go with us. This Mr. West was on his way, with his wife and two girls, to New South Wales, where he meant to build a house in a clear piece of land. We all three then left the ship in our boat, and as we came in sight of Shark Isle, Jack, who was on the fort, fired his guns. When we came to the beach, my wife and the rest were there to meet us. Jane was half wild with joy when she heard that Captain Stone had brought her good news from home. We led them round our house and through the grounds, and Mr. West took note of all he saw. When he came to talk, I found that he had made up his mind to stay with us. I need not say how glad I was to hear this, for he had brought out with him a large stock of farm tools, of which we had long been in want. The boys were of course in high glee at all this, but I did not share their joy as much as I could wish. The ship which now lay close to our shore was the first we had seen since we came to the isle, and no one could tell when the next might come. My wife and I did not wish to leave. I had a love for the kind of life we led, and we were both at an age when ease and rest should take the place of toil. But then our sons were young, not yet in the prime of life, and I did not think it right that we should keep them from the world. Jane, I could tell, would not stay with us, nor did she hide from us the fact that her heart drew her to the dear one at home, from which she had been kept so long. So I told my wife that I would ask my boys to choose what they would do, to stay with us on the isle, or leave with Captain Stone in the ship. Fritz and Jack said they would not leave us. Ernst spoke not a word, but I saw that he had made up his mind to go. I did not grieve at this, as I felt that our isle was too small for the scope of his mind, and did not give him the means to learn all he could wish. I told him to speak out, when he said he should like to leave the place for a few years, and he knew Frank had a wish to go with him. I thought this would give my wife pain, but she said the boys had made a good choice, and that she knew Ernst and Frank would make their way in the world. Captain Stone gave Jane, Ernst and Frank leave to go with him, as there was room in the ship now that the Wests were to stay with us. The ship was brought round to Safe Bay, and Fritz and Jack went on board to fetch Mrs. West and her two girls, who were glad to find that they were not to go back to the ship, for the storm had made them dread the sea. I may here say, by the way, that my wife soon found that her two sons grew fond of their fair friends, and gave me a hint that some day we should see them wed, which would be a fresh source of joy for us. I have not much more to tell. The stores I had laid up, furs, pearls, spice, and fruits, were put on board the ship, and left to the care of my sons, who were to sell them. And then the time came for us to part. I need not say that it was a hard trial for my wife, but she bore up well, for she had made up her mind that it was all for the best, and that her sons would some day come back to see her. I felt, too, that with the help of our new friends, we should not miss them so much as we first thought, and this we found to be the case. As the next day my boys were to leave, I had a long talk with them. I told them to act well their part in the new sphere in which they were to move, and to take as their guide the word of God. They then knelt down for me to bless them, and went to their beds in Rock House for the last time. I got no sleep all that night, nor did the two boys, who were to start the next day. As Ernst takes his tale with him, which I gave him leave to print, that all may know how good God has been to us, I have no time to add more than a few words. The ship that is to take from us our two sons and our fair guest will sail from this coast in a few hours, and by the close of the day three who are dear to us will have gone from our midst. I cannot put down what I feel, or tell the grief of my poor wife. I add these lines while the boat waits for my sons. May God grant them health and strength for the trials they may have to pass through. May they gain the love of those with whom they are now to dwell, and may they keep free from taint the good name of the Swiss family Robinson. The End End of chapter 15. Recording by Gregory Eccles, Bloemfontein, South Africa. End of Swiss Family Robinson in Words of One Syllable by Lucy Aiken.